I am happy to be here. Um, I, I feel uh, somewhat defensive because I don't have a PowerPoint uh, and I don't have data and I don't have graphs to show which will deflect from uh, the lack of a message, but I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, I, I thought I would use this opportunity to, almost, to um, and I think as uh, the chair reflected that we were asked to talk about specific um, experiences with uh, multidisciplinarity. <coughs> And what I will do is give you a very specific case study of uh, work that I have done, and it's completed now, but the evolution of that work from, if you like, um, a, 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 an area of study, and it's in the area of labor regulation, uh, and thinking about labor markets uh, and rigidity and flexibility of labor markets, and I'll come back to that, to deliberate use of the phrase, uh, and how the work that we did over a period of about three years evolved from being, I think, fairly technical and narrow uh, using the toolbox of economists to one that I think became far more uh, multidisciplinary in nature and, and in, in orientation. But perhaps before I do that, just to give you a short story about why um, ensuring that you draw on information and sources of information from uh, a diverse set of uh, experiences and a diverse set of skills uh, um, is, can have tangible consequences. And it's in, funny enough, it's in the area of uh, funeral insurance. Um, in South Africa, uh, uh, the bottom end of the income distribution, uh, the insurance companies make their money off you and I on short-term insurance, but they also make their money off uh, selling funeral insurance in particular in South Africa. And one of the uh, larger companies in South Africa that sells funeral insurance then took this model, uh, which is a model based on marketing funeral insurance, sending out the uh, insurance providers, uh, the sales uh, reps and so on to townships, and, uh, and selling funeral insurance. They took that model and they, they tried it in Kenya and it failed dismally. And the reason was that they didn't, firstly, they, 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 did, they did their investment numbers. So they relied on actuarial research to inform you know, price points and you know, amortization rates and so on. And so they came up with products and so on. But of course, nobody ever spoke to a sociologist or an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. And if they did, they would have known that the attitudes towards death are fundamentally different in South Africa relative to Kenya. In South Africa, we speak about death. The joke is your grandmom or granddad will say, make sure there's chicken at my funeral. You know, I don't want the neighbors to think that I, I don't have decent food at my funeral. But in Kenya, you don't talk about death. Death is, is something that is a, a taboo subject. In West Africa, it's, it's, uh, it's less taboo. So in that sense, if, they had, if the insurance company had actually done their, done their job and actually spoke to people across a variety of disciplines, not just actuaries, they would have come to a very different conclusion. But anyway, I think that's a, a really fun example of, of how uh, multidisciplinarity can have real consequences. So back to my example of a very specific case study of labor regulation. If one, if one looks at the literature, um, in South Africa, sort of post-94, post-apartheid, 95 to 2000, there's a very clear, and even just on the cusp of democracy, there's a very clear dominance in the literature. And, and here I am biased in, in the way that I'm talking about the literature, because it is, I'll come back to that later, it is the literature that I predominantly read. And I think we have to, it's a bit like joining a support group, right? We have to admit that we read predominantly the literature in our field. Uh, I don't th you know, that's just one of those things. But, um, the labor regulation debate can be summarized in the following way. Earnings functions were run by Moabu and Schultz and uh, Peter Moll and a whole lot of other uh, well-known people. Um, and the earnings functions show that the union wage premium was incredibly high. 100% in some cases, Moabu and Schultz farm. And so with that notion on that coefficient, the deduction was made in the literature that you've got incredibly strong trade unions and therefore Right? And therefore, and this, was the, this was the reach into policy, which in, in a country where you've got 25% unemployment rate is not an inconsequential reach, right? Uh, that because of these high coefficients on the union dummy, you had a highly rigid or a highly inflexible labor market. And this debate raged on for at least five to 10 years, I think. Um, 
Uh, we even had Ann Kruger, uh, who was chief economist, I think, for the IMF at the time, listening to these presentations. And then her conclu conclusion was, well, clearly unemployment exists in South Africa because unions are too strong and because wages are too high, bec because of strong unions. And that was, that was the end of the debate for her, right? So that's where, if you like, economic imperialism in terms of the research left us with, uh, it, if we look back now, a fundamentally unsatisfying results, fundamentally narrow view of the world. So, and I was, go it was, I was going through this uh, uh, last night and thinking about, well, how did, how did we go to the next step? Well, it was a light bulb moment, right, that I had together with a uh, labor lawyer. And the light bulb moment went as follows. When I, um, the labor lawyer is very well known, at least to, um, to South Africans in the audience. Uh, he was one of the architects of our constitution, the, you know, the globally famous constitution that we have, um, uh, Halton Cheadle. And, and I was sitting across the table from Halton and I was regaling the story of where the research is in terms of rigidity and flexibility. And he said, well, firstly, I don't understand these terms of rigidity and flexibility. They seem very rhetorical, right? Um, so that was, that was a whole separate discussion. But he said to me, what do you mean unions are too powerful? I don't understand that. He said, do you know that enshrined in our constitution is the right to collective action? So how, wh wh if, you, if you believe that there's a right to collective action, and most, co most democratic countries have that, there's a right to collective action, therefore, how do you interpret as a lawyer, he says to me, the fact that unions are too powerful? He just didn't understand that. And of course, he then went on to, to explain to me, little of which I understood, why the different pieces of the legislation in the Labor Relations Act that we had and in the Constitution um, meant that we had a far less rigid, in my view, or inflexible labor market, right, that the coefficient on the union dummy would suggest. And so out of that conversation, in fact, began a two-year journey with uh, uh, two other, Halton himself and then the second labor lawyer, in which we tried, right? I'm not sure if we succeeded, but we tried really hard to bring the notions of the economics of trade union power and so on, together with how one measures or how one understands labor regulation from a legal context. So what this project then eventually delivered, if you like, was the attempt to recalibrate our understanding of labor market regulation to move it away from firstly this notion that you can take a coefficient or a set of coefficients and assume that that describes rigidity or flexibility in the labor market. Now, um, sorry, I'm just watching the time. I don't want to, um, we will help tremendously, right? You know, again, in, in the labor regulatory uh, uh, field, but I think it's true for other fields. We are helped tremendously by the release almost at the same time of the doing business survey. Um, uh, published by the World Bank. And so the World Bank's doing business survey, as you know, you know, uh, uh, estimates or, or collects information from different countries on a variety of uh, the ease of doing business indicators. So the time it takes to get uh, uh, a firm uh, registered, the time it takes for uh, customs to release your uh, commodities uh, 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 that you've tried to import into the country and so on. But included in the first few, and they've removed it, which I don't understand. So if anybody can explain that to me, um, it'd be wonderful. The World Bank officially can't explain why they've removed it. But in the indicators, they had a labor market module. And the labor market module was not anything to do with the union wage premium, but it was to do with the legislative environment within the country. So what they did was to go into a country, go to a literally a, a law firm, and ask the legal firm to explain the hiring clauses, the firing clauses, the um, uh, cost of uh, uh, the cost of retrenchments, and so on, that the legislation specified. So immediately we we open up our our debate and our understanding of labour regulation away from an earnings function towards uh, the regulatory environment. And why this conversation became good or it became productive was that I was able to sit with the lawyers and say, well, do you agree with these pieces of the legislation that the Doing Business Survey is collecting information on? They would say yes. And of course, what the Doing Business Survey does, most of you have probably used it, is it starts uh, 
doing what economists like, which is to measure and rank things. So we were able to then look at rankings. So if, for example, just uh, uh, if you were retrenched, the law may say that the, your retrenchment package would be the equivalent of one week worth of uh, uh, wages for every year that you worked. But some pieces of legislation in different countries will say, well, you'll get a year's worth of wages uh, for every year that you've worked. And, and so you were able to then generate these rankings. Out of that, what, what we, uh, out of the sort of um, um, the doing business survey, we were able to then produce a far more nuanced assessment of South Africa's uh, labor regulatory environment. So the, 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 the closing off of that research was to show that we actually were, in terms of the labor regulatory environment and the legislation, smack bang in the middle of other middle income country uh, um, uh, estimates. So we looked like Brazil, we looked like Malaysia in terms of our labor regulatory environment. Really, for a country context, fundamentally important in opening up the debate, I think in making people think, well, actually, it's not the legislation. But it went further then. We then, we then had to deal with the problem that when you spoke to, whether it's the World Economic Forum and so on, when you spoke to business leaders, the perception surveys from business leaders was, no, the problem with South Africa in terms of FDI or domestic investment is that uh, labor markets are, uh, are, or labor laws are too strict. But yet our research showed, based on the doing business survey, that it wasn't that strict. That's where the lawyers became useful. They said, the legislation is not a sufficient, right? It's a necessary, this is the, the economists speak, but it's necessary but not sufficient condition for establishing uh, over-regulation or under-regulation. So you see how the language I've used also changed. Uh, rigidity and flexibility is a problematic language. Um, and so what we found was that it was when the judges interpreted the law, right? you had a very particular interpretation in South Africa that the lawyers agreed was infused with the notion that if you, th if you had to interpret the law which said what, uh, an unfair dismissal, that's a subjective notion, unfair dismissal. Training of the judges, particularly in labor law, meant that most of them saw this as the bad employer, the evil capitalist, and I'm overstating it, and the poor worker. And so the notion of justice was infused with the idea that it was in fact, a power relationship between a weak worker and a strong employer. And so out of the labor law, which, which was in terms of pure measurement, actually not over-regulated or overly flexible or overly rigid, you actually got interpretations of the law that tended to be biased towards workers. That's, that was what the evidence showed from the lawyers. So in a sense, for me, um, just to conclude with some lessons, um, the, 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 uh, the case of doing work on uh, labor regulation in South Africa, we've sort of continued with it, uh, uh, but I don't think we've spent enough time actually talking to audiences about, about why one needs to think about bringing economics and law together. But for me, at least personally, and I think for my colleagues in law, it was a really, really useful and fruitful experience. So just five generic lessons, maybe. Um, they won't be the only lessons, of course, and they may be the wrong ones, but for me, the five that were really important. The first is language does matter. I mean, it, it, it was astounding to me how I think, uh, um, uh, I think economists are far too blunt. Economists don't understand the importance. So when, you know, when I went wading in about rigidity and flexibility, I mean, we spent the first half an hour talking about those terms. What do you mean by rigid and flexible? So I think that's a really, really important lesson, at least in, in this particular context. Um, and and the, the notion of union power. What do you mean by union power? For a lawyer, union power is a good thing because it refle reflects democratic rights. That's what you want, right? So it's, uh, the second lesson is read the complementary literature, not just in economics. So, and, and I'm exhibit A, right? And I think all of us, as I said at the beginning, uh, would admit to reading the literature that we're most familiar with, and that literature is the literature we, uh, we took as grad students or the course that we ended up taking. So, but, but it is important to, to read uh, in, the, in, in an area that's outside of your silo. I must, there's a warning label with that. I mean, the law stuff is impossible to understand for me. It's just, you know, so I spend hours trying to understand it, but it's incredibly difficult. So, uh, so that's why collegial interaction is important. So if you work with colleagues uh, in the field, um, it, it actually, and that's my third lesson, if you like, it, 
it um, retains a certain balance of power. This may be a bit controversial, right? So I think it is important to be able to interact with colleagues where you have far less knowledge with, uh, than them in that particular area. Health and economics is a really good example, right? Law and economics. Uh, and so that sort of evenness in the balance of power is important. Final two lessons is I do think, and I think uh, Rachel alluded to it at the beginning, is that I think there are limits to collaboration across disciplines. I don't think, you know, uh, we don't have to be cheerleaders all the time. I think we have to accept that in certain contexts, there's, there's a value add to collaboration, but in other contexts, um, I can teach physicists very little about the laws of gravity, right? So there's no need to collaborate. Um, um, and, and then the final thing is, I think, speaking as economists, I think we, 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 we tend to be too, uh, too focused on measurement and, uh, well, let me restate that. I think measurement is good and it's important, but it's not the only thing. And we tend to lose interest in stories that are told. Sto really interesting contextual stories, uh, economic history stories, uh, cultural stories that are told about the experiences of, uh, of individuals and households and their, and their livelihoods. And I think that's a really important lesson for economists. Okay, let me stop there, thanks. Mm -hmm.